Paul Jackson. He was sort of the rock star of, of the Confederate Army and sort of my Civil War boyfriend, I have to, <laughs> I have to confess. Um, women loved Stonewall. He was eccentric and crazy as hell, but women loved him. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Stonewall Jackson was in the spring of 1862. It was right before his legendary ballot campaign when the Confederates went on a tear and sort of you know, kick some butt in the spring of 1862. He was in a lobby of a hotel in the Shenandoah Valley, and women spotted him, and they flocked toward him, they swarmed him, they were grabbing at his coat, they were pulling at his buttons, they yanked at his beard, they were just all over him. And Stonewall took a step back and said, ladies, ladies, this is the very first time I've been surrounded by the enemy. <laughs> very smooth, right? Um, Belle Boyd, our 17-year-old Confederate spy, probably needless to say, uh, was obsessed with Stonewall Jackson. She would tell reporters that she wanted to, quote, occupy his tent and share his dangers. Um, which, if I were Stonewall Jackson, would have frightened me more than anything the Union Army might have had in store with me. I wouldn't want Belle Boyd anywhere near my tent. Um, but she was obsessed with him, and she was determined to earn his respect and his attention um, before the war was over. That was her main goal in life. Um, and she, uh, she sets about doing that uh, in the spring of 1862, which makes for some very interesting activity during that year. This is another one of my favorite generals. This is Union General George McClellan, uh, who was sort of Stonewall's counterpart in the North. He was sort of the rock star of the North for a while. And as you might discern from his rather Napoleonic stance here, uh, he too had a bit of an ego issue. Um, he used to tell people that God himself had elected him to save the Union. Um, he was quite sure of that. He also told people that he could uh, lift a 250-pound man over his head with one arm, and that he could bend a quarter between his thumb and forefinger. Um, and he uh, was put on an appearance of, of great strength. And he did come in and sort of whip the Union Army into shape and restore morale after the disastrous, ugly defeat at Manassas. And he renamed the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, and he was sort of, you know, bringing them up to speed. Um, but there was one problem with McClellan. He did not like to send his men into battle. He did not like to fight. Um, <laughs> consequently, his men loved him. <laughs> his men loved him because he was not kill getting them killed. Emmett Edmonds, a.k.a. Private Frank Thompson of the 2nd Michigan, was one of McClellan's men, um, and she adored him as well. She had great respect for him. Um, but Lincoln was not so sure about McClellan. He, he rather wanted a swift response to the defeat at Manassas. He wanted the Union Army to retaliate quickly, and McClellan was having none of it. In fact, he just said that Lincoln was nothing more than a well-meaning baboon, um, which did not go over well. And the, uh, the acrimony between the two would only develop as the war went on. This is one of my favorite, favorite cartoons from the Civil War, and my favorite uh, sort of, uh, I guess, research points of the Civil War. Uh, but just to give you a bit of context about this, uh, one of the Union's greatest strategies against the South was to enact a blockade. Um, they blocked off 3,500 miles of Confederate coastline basically starving the South of weapons, food, medicine, coffee, uh, shoes, clothing, anything that not only the Southern Army would need to fight, but things that Southern civilians needed to live. Um, suddenly, there was a great dearth of everything, and, and um, it was a dire, dire situation for Southerners. Um, in response, an equally effective smuggling operation sprung up in its place to sort of counteract this blockade. And this cartoon, which is titled Crinoline and Quinine, celebrates this uh, smuggling effort. And it was mainly the Southern women who took charge of this and sort of uh, were, figured out ways to smuggle things to the Southern soldiers. And as you can see, they used the crinoline, uh, which was that rigid cage-like structure that could stretch a diameter of six feet. And you can imagine, imagine all sorts of things that might be attached to a crinoline uh, that you could sneak across the lines. And just to give you one of my favorite statistics about that, one woman managed to conceal inside her hoop skirt a roll of army cloth, several pairs of cavalry boots, a roll of crimson flannel, packages of gilt braided sewing silk, cans of preserved meats, and a bag of coffee. That's a contraband tally for a single crossing. 
Um, Belle Boyd, our southern uh, Shenandoah Valley spy, was sort of the queen of this sort of uh, smuggling, and she specialized in smuggling weaponry. And to give you an idea of her prowess, um, I should say she did enlist other women to help her. She was also very adept at gathering groups of other southern women and convincing them that they needed to help her smuggle things. Um, but one day in the fall of 1861, the 28th Pennsylvania awoke to discover that 200 sabers, 400 pistols, cavalry equipment for 200 men, and 1,400 muskets were missing. Um, that was all the result of uh, Bell Boyd and her women. And so this is, to me, one of the most fascinating parts of women's roles in the Civil War. You know, they were able to take society's constructs about womanhood and femininity and brilliantly exploit them to their own purposes. Um, they used their gender as both a physical and psychological disguise. You know, physically, they were hiding things in their hoop skirts and on their person and up in their hair. And psychologically, if any of these women were accused of treasonous activity, the standard response was, how dare you? How dare you? I am a defenseless lady. How dare you? And, and their accusers did not quite know how to counter that. And the women knew they wouldn't know how to counter that. So it was very effective, um, at least for a while. Uh, this is uh, another interesting uh, anecdote from the, the annals of smuggling. Um, this is a doll by the name of Lucy Ann. Uh, today she lives at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. But during the war, she was probably the most popular tour uh, for Southern mothers to give to their daughters. And the reason was not that she was a particularly good looking doll or a uh, fun doll to play with, but her head was made of paper mache, and you could stuff a whole bunch of quinine into her head, <laughs> give it to your daughter, and have her smuggle it across the lines for you. Um, so, so that mothers would do this. They would pack these heads full of quinine and give the toys to their daughters and tell them to go across the lines and, and not, you know, alert the sentries to anything suspicious. And I thought this was interesting. Just want to show you how how much Southern women really wanted to insert themselves in the cause, how they wanted to be useful, and how, how they were even willing to risk their own children um, and involve them in their espionage activities. Rosa Neal Greenhow, in particular, used her eighth-year-old daughter, Little Rose, in all of her missions, um, even having her pass messages back and forth to generals. Um, and I just thought it was astounding. You know, these eight-year-old girls were, were winning or unwitting spies at, at that young age. Now this, I hope you all had dinner. So <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the story as it was told to me. Um, I was at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, and the curator came out holding this little object in her hand. And she said that a couple years earlier, a woman came in and said that her ancestor had been a Confederate spy, and that he used this little contraption in his espionage work. And he would take his little dispatches and roll them up in tiny scrolls, tuck them in the side of this object, and then hide that object in the place least likely to be searched. Um, the curator uh, decided, of course, to give it a rather official sounding name. She decided to name this contraption the Anal Acorn. Um, so uh, I do not know how many Confederate soldiers were subjected to the Anal Acorn. But once I heard about this, I was like, you know what? That was not in my history book in high school. I'm putting it in my book. <laughs> so this uh, brings us back to the, the uh, blockade um, and just shows you how dire things have gotten. Um, just to give you a little context here, by 1864, the blockade was so dire uh, that, that people in the South were literally starving. Um, inflation was out of control. Uh, Things were cost prohibitive. Nobody could afford food. To give you one example, bacon was $20 a pound in 1864. That's $300 in today's money for a pound of bacon. So people could not afford to eat. And this cartoon reflects Southerners' uh, quite understandable anger at the situation. Um, they were starving. And this is sort of presents their wish fulfillment of things that they wish they could be smuggling through the lines. Um, the item at the top left is a goblet made from a Yankee skull. <laughs> right below that, we have a necklace made of Yankee teeth. And then up there, we have a, a paperweight made of Yankee jawbones. And there are similar, similarly gruesome items throughout there. Now, these were not real items, although there were reports of the goblets made of Yankee skull, I have to say. And there were also reports of women uh, wearing, Southern women wearing jewelry and brooches made of Yankee bones. 
It was actually quite popular to, to um, gather uh, dead soldiers, dead human soldiers' bones and make elaborate jewelry out of it. But otherwise, these things were not real, um, but just reflecting Southern, Southerners' anger at the situation uh, that the blockade presented back late in the war. This is President Abraham Lincoln with uh, the famous Detective Alan Pinkerton, um, who was contracted early on to do Secret Service work for the Union, and who became one of my favorite characters. He was such a strange, strange man. Um, and he had his job was sort of twofold. He was supposed to figure out Confederate positions and troop numbers, which he was terrible at. Um, he and McClellan were both terrible at this. They were constantly overestimating Confederate numbers. Um, they were always badgering looking for more soldiers um, when they were really, you know, had three times the manpower the South did, but yet it wasn't enough. But he, his second part of his job was ferreting out Confederate spies, which he actually was quite good at. And his very first mission in that regard was to conduct a stakeout on suspected Confederate spy Rose O'Neill Greenhow. They had to figure out who was behind the disastrous defeat at Bull Run, uh, Manassas. And all fingers pointed toward this, this widow living in Washington, D.C. It was Rosie Neal Greenhow. So Pinkerton decides to suss her out. And one of my favorite scenes in the book it was in the summer of 1861. Pinkerton and two of his best men go to Rose's home in Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. And uh, Pinkerton actually has to stand on his two men's shoulders just to get a peek into her parlor. And what does he see but Rosie Neal Greenhow sitting on her couch with a man that Pinkerton recognizes as a Union captain. And he looks a little bit closer and he sees they're, they're looking over efficient looking papers and maps and sort of pouring over things. And Pinkerton is incensed. Clearly this is a traitor's Union captain. He's showing Rose all these official documents for the Union Army. So he waits a few minutes and sure enough, Rose and Neil Greenhelm begins passionately kissing this Union captain, which infuriates Pinkerton even further um, that, that this traitor's Union captain would go that far. Um, so he declares that Rose is going to be public enemy number one, and he makes it his mission to bring down her Confederate spy ring and, and stop her in her tracks. And it begins a sort of cat and mouse game that plays out throughout the war between these two that I, I found really fascinating. Um, and then it also uh, signaled another really interesting uh, uh, concept of women's roles in the Civil War. You know, women's loyalty was also always assumed. Women were supposed to be victims of war. They weren't perpetrators of war. And now, you know, evidence was starting to arise that women were not only capable of treasonous activity, but they were capable of executing it more deftly than men. And the North did not know quite how to handle this evidence. They did not know what to do. And one of my very favorite quotes in the book, um, you can almost hear, one of Lincoln's officials said, and you can almost hear the sort of perplexed questioning in this, in this quote, but he said, what are we going to do with these fashionable female spies? Um, <laughs> And you almost felt sorry for her, but not quite. Um, and it was a real problem for them. Um, if they treated them too uh, harshly, they risked elevating these women to the status of martyr. Um, but if they treated them too leniently, um, they risked these women doing some serious damage in terms of gathering intelligence and, and making a difference in battles that would affect the North. Uh, so they had to figure out how to do something, and they had to figure it out fast. So this is my final.